Okay, welcome everyone. Um, we'll just wait another minute or two as, as uh, people come through the waiting room door and then we'll make a start. Thank you. Okay, well, we're just after four o'clock. So thank you everyone for coming and a uh, very warm welcome to everyone on a frosty November day as well. Uh, glad to say that we're in the second of our six webinars in the third series. Um, and um, really everybody's very welcome to join us. Got a terrific uh, set of speakers today. Our third speaker is uh, will be joining slightly late but uh, Javeria, as usual, will do the honors and introduce everyone. Um, I just wanted to just say a few words about the global webinar series and its kind of aims. Uh, there'll be some new people who will be joining us for the first time, maybe less familiar with what we are trying to do. I guess really it's easily summed up as a desire to have a conversation about big world issues from diverse perspectives, uh, diverse sources, diverse uh, disciplines, as well as different occupations, for example, uh, as not just uh, scholarly, but others as well. And I think the idea is also to try to, when we can, uh, try to get people from different parts of the world uh, who have different kind of perspectives and, and so on, on big world issues. So we're partly uh, inspired by the decolonization movement, but not only that, because there are many other ways in which we can diversify the basis of our knowledge and get perhaps better empirical, as well as perspectival understandings of what is going on in the world. So that's the basic aim. We have these, uh, these uh, webinars, we record the webinars, uh, we put them out on YouTube when they become available. Uh, we also ask speakers to write a short, maybe a 2000 word blog or blog post, or a short working paper as well. So we can use it as a kind of teaching resource, a learning resource for students as well. Uh, which perhaps provides perspectives which we don't always necessarily get so easily otherwise. So that's the basic aim. And um, now I'll hand over to uh, Javaria to introduce our speakers uh, and the topic for today. Thank you. Great, thanks Indrajit. So our discussion today is about political strategies of the United States and the implications and trajectories of these, particularly given the recent context of Afghanistan and Iraq. So to discuss what this all means for the material basis of US power, we have assembled an impressive panel that includes Dr. Bamu Nuri, who joins us from the University of West London. His research interests include American foreign policy and the international and domestic policies of the Middle East. Bamu has a PhD degree from City University of London, as well as degrees in law and in human rights. His recent book, Elite Theory and the 2003 Iraq Occupation by the United States, How U.S. Corporate Elites Created Iraq's Elitist Political System, was published by Routledge earlier this year, and um, it studies the nature, drivers, and legacies of U.S. power. We also have with us today Dr. Sashi Kumar Sundaram. He's a lecturer in international politics at City University of London. His PhD is from the Central European University in Budapest, and he has held postdoctoral roles at the American University in Washington, D.C., and at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. He has also held research positions at the Institute for Defense Studies and Analyses in New Delhi, the Norwegian Institute of Defense Studies in Oslo, and has worked on a major research project on Indian Parliament and India's nuclear and missile policy making. Sashi's main research interests lie in international relations theory, status, and reputation concerns of global South states, with special reference to India, Brazil, and China, and the critical geopolitics 
of Sino-Indian rivalry on global order. We also have with us Dr. Maria Ryan, who will be joining us shortly. She is an assistant professor in American history at the University of Nottingham. Her research is on US foreign policy and her most recent book, Full Spectrum Dominance, Irregular Warfare and the War on Terror, was published with the Stanford Press in 2019. She's also written about neoconservatism, intellectuals, and US foreign policy, intelligence, and the CIA, the Bush administration, and the war on terror. Her new research project, uh, project is on the origins and uh, the future of the US-China tech war. Thank you for joining us, and welcome to the webinar. OK, so Bama, uh, Bama you're up uh, for about 20 minutes, and then Q&A. And uh, I should just remind listeners and uh, viewers, I guess, um, that we have the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free at any point to, to write in any questions and we will curate them a little bit later on. Thanks very much. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, great to be here. So my talk today is entitled Iraq, divided by the US and dominated by Iran. Where is Iraq's Iran-led cycle headed? Now, I'd say it's quite difficult to talk about where things are headed without acknowledging the forces that have brought uh, Iraq to where it is now. So the US occupation, its failures, and this obviously created Iran's opportunity, uh, which basically was capitalized upon. And amid all of that, given the latest elections that we've just seen, there are potentials for a new dawn. Now, I'm going to obviously discuss that uh, shortly. Now, the outcome or fruits of US strategy in Iraq is in many ways undesired like that of what happened in Afghanistan with the Taliban. Um, and although today I'm gonna to focus on the kind of domestic impact of US strategy, the consequences for Iraq are not just domestic. Instead, we've seen the rise of Iran in the Middle East uh, region as a direct result to the, or a direct result of the uh, US occupation and the power dynamics there have basically changed. But when thinking about today's talk and thinking about how to discuss where your strategy towards Iraq may be headed, I couldn't help but feel that I had to, in some ways, address this talk in a multidimensional way. So I firstly felt that too often Western scholars, analysts and experts uh, analyze and even formulate U.S. strategy without really understanding uh, the sophistications of how the applications of such strategies actually play out in practice on the ground. And instead, it's only when policies are exposed as out and out failures or when a crisis emerges like what we saw recently with the Afghanistan uh, crisis only then does the focus move away from foreign policy into the details of the domestic setting so the broad point here is to stress the importance of understanding the role of domestic politics and drivers and the way domestic factions or even neighboring states may interpose to reverse the bigger foreign policy uh, strategy now given that my esteemed um, colleagues Sashi and Maria will kind of look at the bigger uh, macro picture. I'm going to focus on the smaller domestic picture and the kind of domestic dynamics um, from inside Iraq. So that being said, my talk will focus on analyzing how the very ideas the US basically had for Iraq never reached fruition due to the disastrous inconsistency in practice, which then created failures that were capitalized upon by Iran to the point where I argue strongly, and I recently wrote a piece, that Iraq has basically become Iran's cash cow for its regional uh, strategy. I'll elaborate on the approach of Iran, their successes, and how this cycle is maintained to a point where the US, simply put, has had very, very little influence in Iraq for the last kind of 10 to 12 years. And then I'll finish with a bit more uh, optimism in terms of where I believe it may be headed which is a positive outlook, an opportune uh, moment for both Iraq and US strategy uh, in Iraq and the region. Now, with the latest October 2021 Iraqi parliamentary elections recording basically the lowest ever voter turnout in post-2003 Iraq, there's little doubt that Iraq's yet to be announced next government already faces a massive uh, legitimacy crisis. And amid the problems that Iraq faces, in overcoming these uh, challenges, there's a massive driver of this uh, cyclical political system in neighboring Iran, which I believe isn't discussed enough uh, or simply put not understood uh, as it should be. Now, whether Western scholars, analysts and policymakers like to admit it or not, Iran is now a key regional force in the Middle East. 
And Iraq is one of the key uh, cash cows that funds and maintains this power. Of course, Iran's domination uh, of Iraq hasn't happened by accident, nor is it easy to uh, alleviate. Now, Tehran's systematic success, I'd say, can be explained by understanding how the legacy of the US occupation in Iraq created opportunities that were complexly capitalized upon by Iraq. And from here, understanding how uh, Iraq stagnation is maintained also enables not just understanding of how to move forward for Iraq, but also an in-depth understanding around how deep and far the repercussions of unregulated US power can go and how complicated actually the legacies of uh, foreign policy can be. Now, I always argue that the US had the right ideas for Iraq in 2003, although my book is a kind of multi-dimensional comprehensive uh, insight and critique into to how the occupation turned out but the approach of the US and obviously the audacity of it from the bombing campaign uh, purposely dividing Iraqis in the constitution making process marginalizing uh, Iraqis corruption by the occupation authorities under democratic selections of Iraqi elites uh, mass violations of international law and the kind of main one had a big impact on Iraq's future and how Iraqi elites would operate, this kind of zero bid contracts to corporations where US decision makers had interests uh, and to Bush election campaign donors. Now, these are all things that I've gone into great depth uh, in, in terms of details in my book. But alongside all that, uh, there was also a clear disregard for the will, interests and security of ordinary Iraqis, which basically contributed to a massive anti-US insurgency, as opposed to what the US was basically expecting uh, in terms of you know, a warm embrace. Now, there's no doubt that corporate US elites creating Iraq's political system using divide and conquer uh, approaches right from the get-go would be a disaster when adding to the kind of complex challenges that dominates a deeply divided Iraq. Now, from kind of the US occupation, just to contextualize how Iraq's political system would then look post 2005 would be a mixture of many different intricacies. So past social customs of socialism, historically uh, deep rooted divides, a legacy of the US occupation, and this kind of elite political system that it left, all of which creates a culture in Iraq that we have to this day where short term fixes and interests dominate the thinking of politicians and ordinary Iraqis and even the exhausting task of changing the system is normally best centered around revolution culture, which is a legacy of past uh, regimes, usually involving demonstrations or political violence. But none of these things actually address the intellectual roots and cyclical drivers of uh, Iraqi society and politics, i.e. the very ideas, thoughts and beliefs that drive it and which continue to produce its leaders, political outcomes um, and directions. Now, with the failures of the US in Iraq, they were basically broadcast to the world, opinion polls plummeted far and wide, and the kind of big out conclusion, if you like, uh, or outcome for uh, opinions was that the US couldn't truly deliver security and peace in that region. On the kind of flip side, or on the opposite side of the token, you had Iran, who has this kind of massive um, idea of uh, empowering and, and um, you know supporting the regions she is in a Sunni dominated Middle East a massively ambitious task but very achievable because of the different intricacies that were leveraged upon uh, based on the uh, opportunity creating US failures with basically Iraq becoming the central pivot point, uh, point uh, economically and militarily now what we then saw was kind of this capitalization uh, of the strategically weak and divided Iraqi state uh, with, also, with also Iran kind of working hard to not just capitalize in the short term, but also maintain a, a structure that would serve its own uh, interests. And we've seen Iran formally kind of word on the street inside Iraq. They're seen as the kind of this, this dominant authority and widely now recognized as, a, as, as the kind of main winner of the uh, 2003 occupation. Interestingly, its strategy in Iraq hasn't come out of a vacuum. It's kind of emerged from the original Iraq-Iran war, which basically shaped the intellectual foundations of this current military uh, model that it employs now, with Iran uh, having suffered more than a million casualties and just uh, under half a million fatalities and the cost of war being around 600 billion, 
and massive long-term damage to Iran's economy and infrastructure. There were lessons here that were to be kind of you know, manipulated and capitalized upon. And the policy that Iran would basically pursue moving forward would be to uh, create and condition allies where future domestic defenses or any foreign activities would, would depend on layered defenses and uh, asymmetric uh, responses. So that basically if a threat came to Iran from a bigger power, it could involve all the different uh, states in the Middle East region that it had influence. Now, even if you look at the Islamic uh, Republic's constitution, there's clear intent to export the revolution. And since the 80s, we've basically seen this uh, take place in practice. So from 79, when the revolution took place, uh, the supreme leaders in Iran have led a kind of foreign policy where Iran acts as the self-appointed leader of the world's uh, Shia Muslims with an emphasis on those in close proximity in the Middle East. And we've seen various regional uh, interventions in defense of Shiite Islam uh, as well. If you fast forward to kind of 2021, that was just to provide a con uh, context. Iraq has a presence now in, uh, sorry, Iran has a presence now in Iraq, Lebanon, uh, Palestine, Syria, uh, Yemen, with activities and influence in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain and Kuwait as well, as well as other influence in wider Asia, uh, including even Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan. For the US, it was this case of initially having the right ideas, but then this kind of turned into gifting uh, Iraq to, to Iran. And this intricate approach basically means that Iranian influence in Iraq is not a kind of uh, one dimensional aspect. It's actually very, very deep. It's multifaceted and it's deeply embedded. And most importantly, it's very, very well maintained and managed, whereby the economic and security aims of Tehran are pursued from and through Baghdad uh, directly. And there's three key areas, really, that I would say um, shape uh, and, and kind of capture Iranian uh, dominance inside Iraq. And you've got initially the, the security role that Iran plays, so put that at the kind of top priority. Then you've got the economic side, i.e. Um, Iraq's market. And you've got then the kind of political and ideological, which takes place via uh, both the economic side and obviously the security side, just going on to the role that Iran plays in Iraq in terms of security and national security. We know that as a legacy of the US occupation and this kind of divide uh, amongst Iraqi elites and the Iraqi populace, Iraq doesn't have a uh, convincing or strong national identity. So when, when, it, when it's faced uh, challenges, so we saw with the kind of um, emergence of ISIS in Mosul, the Iraqi army fled. And then from kind of 2003, 2014 onwards, the Iraqi state has depended on Iranian state sponsored and connected militias for its own national security needs. And these proxies are actually embedded formally uh, into Iraq's military and security services since uh, to 2016. And they also hold key strategic roles and locations. Now, what we've also seen uh, in the kind of last five to six years is using the security apparatus for uh, both political and ideological uh, means, but also the main benefit that Iran takes from Iraq is the economic uh, benefit. So in terms of the market, the majority of goods and products in Iraq come from neighboring Iran, food, construction materials, uh, pharmaceuticals, even services, be it security, construction, even you know, rubbish truck uh, services. And through those two platforms, we're seeing this kind of dominant role of Iran politically and ideologically. So there's strong influence in um, the kind of selections of the PM, cabinet members and ministers, massive interference from Iran there. We're also seeing this uh, non-discriminatory uh, approach that Iran has been able to leverage effectively in Iraq by basically advising, funding and arming uh, the latter in some cases, political parties, uh, individual uh, candidates, and even uh, seeing how Iran doesn't really have one particular horse that it wants to back. It wants to actually approach and work with and is willing to work with all political parties. And in, in the kind of amalgamation of everything that I've just kind of highlighted in terms of how Iran operates in Iraq, Tehran is able to impact Iraqi national strategy, 
uh, it embeds pro-Iranian sentiments, anti-US uh, sentiments, uh, anti-Saudi Arabia ideology through so many different means. And obviously all of this helps to maintain, um, uh, you know, or it works hard to maintain a, a cycle which keeps Iraq in its servitude, which again, I'll, um, I'll elaborate on in the Q&As, but that's also quite, quite deep in terms of the different um, kind of mechanisms that are at play there. But I want to kind of conclude on a more positive note by highlighting the possibilities for a new dawn uh, in Iraq. Now, for US strategy specifically in the region, the latest elections suggest that the political tectonics in Iraq may be moving away from Iranian influence, as Muqtada al-Sada, who is uh, an Iraqi nationalist known for his indirect uh, anti-Iran sentiments, witnessed his party gain the most uh, seats in the latest elections. Meanwhile, the actual coalition, Fatah, which basically represents the Iranian-backed proxies, saw a massive decrease of seats in the, in the election. So these are quite promising on their own, but also even more promising for the US is that uh, Muqtada al-Sada actually changed his previous anti-US sentiments and is now calling for US forces to remain in Iraq. Now, that's a kind of big, you know, green light, positive outcome of these elections. But at the same time, we've got a problem where, you know, since the last elections in 2018 and even the ones before then, Historically, faith in changing the political system through the ballot box has been on a decrease since 2005. And the basically, uh, the, the other thing to consider is that challenge comes from, uh, in terms of changing Iraq, you know, beyond Iranian influence or, you know, an, an independent united Iraq is also uh, facing challenges from a very, very divided Iraqi elite that basically operates or, or maintains dominance through this jobs for vote scheme, where those who do vote actually vote for the political parties that control the ministries they're employed by. And if you look in the latest elections, it wasn't a surprise to those who follow it that there was such a low turnout of 41%, but the 9 million Iraqis who actually voted were almost equal to the amount on the public uh, sector payroll. So there's also interest in Iran and also uh, by Iraqi elites as well to keep this political system the same because it gives elites access to budget holding and controlling ministries. And with Iraq being this big internal consumer market and, you know, 40 million Iraqis who are basically consuming and not producing, and all of the, or the majority of the products or the markets are dominated by Iranian produce, this benefits Iran and it benefits Iraqi elites. Now, that being said, there is hope, even in the daunting fact that only 41% of Iraqis came out to vote. This can be seen optimistically because it shows that there's a, a great opening for the emergence of new ideas to create a unifying and purpose-driven national identity. And the main opportunity here really is understanding that around 70% of Iraqis are under 35 and are ready to be mobilized in many ways with around um, 700,000 Iraqis entering the uh, job market every year with little or no prospects. This might be a momentous uh, point on all fronts for Iraq to basically design and implement a new deal type of intervention through new programs, intellectual models with focuses on privatization and a truly free, uh, free market because there's so much unemployment and we're seeing a kind of decrease in uh, fossil fuel usage and, and obviously the pandemic bore its own economic lessons for Iraq. And this, this opportunity could bring Iraqis together in reviving the private sector and we could even see the creation of millions of jobs and opportunities for a population that's basically otherwise been ignored. Uh, by Iraq's elites as, as well as the, uh, the rest of the elites in the region. Now, there are other challenges. I mean, the World Bank is noting that around 12 million Iraqis could become vulnerable to poverty very soon. And there's also a financial crisis with a um, kind of big deficit and a, and a big debt in excess of uh, $80 billion. Now, for US strategy, keeping Iran at bay might involve helping Iraq develop and implement its own, you know, New Deal-esque uh, policy, which comprehensively reconciles Iraq's people, which have been kind of neglected, and also politicians inclusively and simultaneously at the same time. 
and I would also kind of note caution, although it seems that Iranian influence and popularity might be waning based on the uh, election results, it should also be kind of understood that Tehran's approaches to secure an influence in the region and inside Iraq have been very dynamic and also hard wearing and effective in actually managing different crises that they, they've seen. For example, uh, Iran's managed to keep a very unsettled uh, Iraq consistently in its servitude whilst managing other challenges uh, to its influence from the US. Now, the kind of other big caution point is that even if politically Iran seems to not receive the, the you know support that it once had, Iranian influenced and backed proxies and militias are formally embedded as part of Iraq's um, security apparatus. So there's a permanent channel of influence in the country. And it, you know, Iraq is too important financially for Iran to let go without a multidimensional fight. But I would say that if Iraq is to genuinely kind of break free from the dominance of Iran, uh, and if the US is to uh, re-engineer its influence in the country, then the time of opportunity is, I would say, now, uh, based on the recent outcomes and where Iraq stands with its challenges. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Bamo. You're spot on the time. Well done. Didn't have to intervene at all. <laughs> Unlike in Iraq, everybody's intervening, um, which is great. I'm really fascinated by your talk. So, so basically, your argument is that Iraq's elites themselves uh, are benefiting from the level of Iranian influence, uh, which obviously retains them in power. Uh, but at the same time, you seem quite optimistic about the prospects for change because so many people are excluded from benefits of, uh, of the Iraqi resources and so on. So how, who is organizing? Who is the, where, where is the party or organization or movement which is actually driving the possibilities of this change? Or is that still not clear? I think it, it, in many ways it's still not clear, but there's a big youth um, and, and civic movement at the moment where people are looking and then different groups are looking to kind of come up. Even like there, there was an example with actually Zara uh, Ali, who we had in one of the other um, webinars. And she basically highlighted how even in the protest movements in Iraq, they were kind of coming out with these different ways of managing the protests on a daily basis through new ideas of democracy and how they should bring all different people in and how people should operate. There's a whole movement in Iraq that really understands democracy, how it should be implemented and actually where Iraq needs to go politically, um, you know, economically. And this kind of this group of Iraqis you could almost identify them by saying that they express their will by not voting. These are the ones who don't vote. And these are the ones that actually protested and were actually calling for a you know whole removal of the, the political system and establishment. But I think there are different uh, movements that are taking place in Iraq, but they're not as organized as should be and could be. And I think USAID actually is, is working with a lot of these different organizations now and thinking about how to to turn their ideas into actual policies. And I've been also working with loads of different intellectuals and MPs to kind of see how their movements are coming. But there's also a lot of um, challenges to that. We know that those who have anti-Iranian uh, sentiments, like the massive uh, case of Hisham al-Hashimi, which you might have heard of, he was a good friend of um, Toby Dodge and the, the guys at Chatham House as well. He was actually an advisor to Prime Minister uh, Mustafa Qadmi at the time. And he just kind of saw the protesters on TV saying, you know, um, we don't want Iran to, to have an influence in Iraq. And he just supported what they were saying. And he was killed uh, mm -hmm. shortly after. So there's, there's a big influence uh, and challenge also. So the movements aren't emerging in a way that we would expect in a kind of liberal Oh. Uh, space they're much more kind of undercover underground but there are movements emerging hmm. well we can talk about a, that a bit later we got a question on the q a from from sean stars one of our new colleagues um uh, in the department of international politics at city he, he thanks you uh and says he learned a lot from your talk but he says but can you please elaborate why you think it's positive that there is the possibility that the u.s can increase its influence in iraq 
it seems that the US invasion and occupation were not a net positive for the Iraqi people. And has Iranian influence been even worse? I'd say it, it, there's a positive for US influence because you've got two kind of competing ideologies. So you've got the Iranian ideology in terms of will fund and arm all the different political parties, because in Iraq now, political parties are like, they have their own militias and the funding and support of these comes from uh, Iran predominantly. And it's part of this kind of indiscriminate uh, approach and policy. But with these different groups that want to emerge, they also need training, they need financial support. They need aid. And I think that's kind of the influence that the US can have in a positive way to actually build institutions meaningfully or help build them meaningfully, as opposed to kind of going in with a idea or ideology, imposing it and then thinking it will disseminate by itself in a place that's so anti-foreign intervention. So I think that's that's the when I say there's a kind of scope to intervene or for US strategy, there's almost a kind of for the first time in a long time, and it has been probably since 2018, a desire and an acceptance and an actual will really for a free market. People want to earn their wages with dignity. You've got this kind of generation where parents are now going against children. The parents are on these public sector salaries from these budget holding parties, but their children are unemployed and their children are the ones protesting, but the parents are saying, look, I'll give you part of my salary we're still better off than the others don't go out there and don't go and protest but if you've got you know almost let's say 25 million Iraqis and you understand how to win an election and how election uh, winning strategies work then if a whole new program of ideas were to be uh, implemented then this opportunity to mobilize the majority of Iraqis for, for towards new ideas because the faith in political parties has pretty much disappeared you know Iraqis don't see politicians they're the most untrusted uh, sources of kind of movements ideas around the world anyway but in Iraq it's really bad and those that voted voted because their livelihoods depend on it so there's almost that vacuum there for the projection of new ideas, new programs to help Iraq stand on its feet uh, in that regard. And, and, you know, if the U.S. is worried about Iran, which it always will be, then there's the kind of there's that opportunity in that regard. But it's not the, you know, obviously the ideal outcome would be if Iraq could do all this by itself. But it, it simply put, it can't. And there's, there's the other thing to kind of note to understand with Iraq is that the yearly budget is around eighty nine billion dollars. 60 billion of it is just goes to civil service salaries and pensions. There's very little fiscal stimulus and investment into the state uh, and the, the private sector by Iraqi elites. So the, the, there's also that in terms of the foreign aid, there could be a, a big positive. But Bamo, the, I mean, there's a load of issues and questions which come up, but Iraq is a very rich oil, oil rich country. So where is all that revenue going? Why is that not? I mean, if you look at oil rich countries around that region and elsewhere as well, you, you, you do see quite heavy investment in, in infrastructure and so on and, and the state jobs, education and so on. So, and Iraq clearly before the war and before the Gulf War, you know, back in 1990, 91, uh, it had a quite a powerful kind of state sector, a social mm -hmm. sector as well. And so why is, where is all the oil revenue going? This is the, the issue that with Iraqi elites controlling, because in the this is what happens. So you have elections, then you have the different uh, factions who won seats in the elections come together for normally it takes about three, four, maybe at one point, even eight months to form uh, a government because they're sharing mm -hmm. these different ministries that basically control the budgets. Mm -hmm. And those who control those budgets and these salary holding uh, institutions there's a lot of corruption in that mix. And that's kind of the main thing because you have so many divided uh, Iraqi elites and you have new ones emerge every year. We don't have a united strategy or approach. So it goes to these different factions where there's probably 15 different groups and this money doesn't go into investments. It goes back onto, uh, you know, the, the payroll, which is then kind of spent by people on goods and services from neighboring countries because we don't produce anything anymore and amid all of that there's loads of mass 
corruption, for example, an institution will register, you know, three or four people that aren't even employed or alive, you know, to take that salary. And there's so many other implications there as well. It's not just yeah. a case of, I mean, in a, in like a, maybe a, a state where there's one particular party or one particular family or government, there might be much more organization, but there's so much more divide oh. uh, and competing elites in Iraq. That's what, what the issue is. So is the strategy basically to to kind of play off Iran Iran and its kind of patronage with stronger US patronage? No. That's a pragmatic approach or with a view to kind of utilizing the benefits of each to to be build a more independent kind of Iraq? Or is it really? I mean, I guess the question that Sean was asking and that I would ask also is the US is responsible for the position largely that yeah. the, the Iraq finds itself in. How is it, how can it be the solution to the problem, given that what it what it did? I think that's you always with the with the US occupation, the way I see it is the US came in with the kind of free market ideas were largely positive to an extent in terms of if you understand Iraq's structure the way it works and the way the the world is headed so for example the expectation right now and in, in iraq by ordinary iraqis is to keep iraq socialist that the only answer is to kind of go on the government salary payroll but we know that with things like let's say uh covid for example where no oil was selling iraq was quickly finding itself dipping into its reserves to pay these salaries so we need to establish a a private market, a private sphere where there's opportunities to mobilize our youth. Otherwise, you know, we've got loads of Iraqi youth, 700,000 every year coming into the job market unemployed. Then you've got ISIS on one hand, employing people and paying people salaries. Then you've got Iranian proxies and new militias and political party militias. So it's almost to kind of say, yes, Iraq, uh, you know, the problems in Iraq were largely caused by the US. But there's so many lessons that have since emerged, and, and my book being one of them, you know, the just basic understandings of how Iraqi uh, society works, that there is an opportunity there to kind of rectify that big wrong, because the US intervention has opened a whole new kind of implications that can't surely just be left with the idea that, okay, the US came in, they did bad once, that's it you know, the leader of the free world should still have a responsibility in that regard. But, in you know, it's either that or things will just carry on the same already. We've seen now uh, things are going back to exactly how they were, where you have an unrepresentative elitist Iraqi uh, government, dysfunctional in strategy, and it'll be the same cycle. And this is this cycle hasn't been broken since 2005. So, Yes, ideally, it would be great if Iraq could do it by itself, but there is a responsibility by the US. And it's not as simple as, for me anyway, that the US kind of messed up and therefore they should be expelled. It, I see it as the opposite. There's a responsibility there to kind of really uh, turn around this disaster. Just one last question, because it's so interesting. I mean, we could ask 100 questions. Uh, there's there's a few questions on the on the Q and A as well, but there's a really interesting question by Rodrigo Amaral, a member of the audience, who says, "How would you analyze the composition of the post Saddam political elite in the 1990s, and the participation of the U.S. in the process?" Because it seems to me that you are kind of you don't really see a future for that group of people in the change that the change you would like to see in Iraq. Yeah, so so the, the Iraqi elites that were inside Iraq before 2003, is that the question about them? Yeah, well, the, it's the 1990s and beyond. So and I guess to some extent, the one that followed the U.S. occupation yeah. was constructed during the U.S. occupation. Yeah, I think it depends how you look at it, right? So you have a president now in Barham Saleh who's loved by the U.S., and also loved by Iran at the same time. And part of the management of the prime ministerial or presidency role in Iraq is to keep all the different competing uh, powers kind of happy with the, with the role that you play. Even the president, if you were to kind of, you know, say, you know, how do we judge his character? He's somebody who's benefited massively from the occupation, from the kind of 
being his party being selected or being worked with by uh, you know the US before the 2003 the Iraq war you know the uh, president Talabani becoming the president many years before him there's many elite groups that Washington worked with before 2003 that I actually highlight in my uh, book that continue to dominate the key positions and influential positions in Iraq post uh, 2003 how do I see these elites? These elites will always have a role in the sense that they're, you know, someone like Berham, even though he's known to be a corrupt person himself, for example, he was, uh, he left his party around 2016, started a new party, the Coalition for Democracy and Change, outwardly slated the PUK, uh, you know, talked about how corrupt they were, how backwards they were, and then they offered him a route back to into becoming the president of Iraq, and he left his coalition party and went straight back to the PUK. So there's, there's obviously a future for these different groups in Iraq, but I also think that the those groups that the US worked for before to but worked with before 2003 and if you look at the KDP, the PUK that were you know around in the 90s, these, these political parties are only able to manage their power right now because they control ministries and they control salaries. If you were to have an alternative idea in Iraq that challenged this kind of current socialist model, it would take off and their positions would be under threat. But we don't have that idea. And there's a massive kind of intellectual repression campaign that takes place uh, behind the scenes to kind of keep Iraqis despondent, to keep Iraqis thinking the same. For example, people have, you know, six, seven hours of electricity a day. They have to kind of constantly watch when the water's going to come back. Water comes every, you know, two or three days. Then you've got the civil service salary crisis that, you know, when the oil price rises or dips, people don't get paid and they're all of a sudden worried about whether they're going to be able to eat tomorrow or not. If Iraqis live like this, the, this kind of intellectual repression prevents them from you know, having broader ambitions. Nobody really cares about strategies in the long term. They just want to make sure that their seven, eight hundred dollars comes in each month and they can feed a family of five or six with it. So those Iraqi elites will, as long as this, this cycle continues, they've got a long future, but it's breaking that cycle that's kind of pivotal to bring in new ideas and a new party to actually not just, you know, act out those ideas, but the, there's a whole demand or a massive opportunity for intellectual regeneration of the Iraqi state to change the way people think, almost like an intellectual paradigm. And I think this is what this kind of 41% of voters turning out spells an opportunity for. Okay. Thank you, Bermo. We are out of time, unfortunately, for, for your particular intervention. Uh, but thank you so much for that illuminating talk. It is it is a bleak picture, but it's good to see that you can see something, uh, some prospects for change, positive change there as well. Thank you so much. Um, we move on to our second speaker now, uh, Sashi uh, from City University. And... Um, Sashi, you have, uh, you're, yeah, you're up. Thank you, Indrajit, and thank you, Juari, for, for introducing, and it, it's nice to meet the fellow panelists. So the title of my talk is uh, New Wars, Old Rules, and Return of Irresponsible Statecraft in uh, Southern Asia. So to some extent, how I'm going to frame this uh, conversation is uh, taking the macro level perspective. So we, um, we saw in the previous talk by Baumo, we had micro level sort of dynamics. Um, I'd like to take one step above and take a sort of a macro level perspective. I will situate the talk in the context of American withdrawal from Afghanistan, the rapid collapse of the US backed former Afghanistan government and the effective collapse of the um, effective control of Taliban in Afghanistan. My focus uh, will be on the broad implications on the even to geopolitical rules in Southern Asia, looking specifically at uh, Pakistan, India, and China, among other um, smaller states. The central argument um, that I'd like to propose here is that we witness indeed a return of geopolitics with the American withdrawal in Afghanistan, where new wars now rely on technology such as uh, drone strikes and this technology uh, is able to achieve uh, its goals with impunity. Yet these new wars still rely on old rules, 
uh, with India-Pakistan rivalry, Sino-Indian rivalry, US emphasis on state building and market reforms, United States competition with China, and sort of larger neoliberal understanding of maintaining the existing hierarchy still plays the role it does. The implication of this is that India, Pakistan, and China must rely on a problematic conduct of statecraft where political actors want to turn um, into Bismarck's or Kissinger's as the only way to survive in this game. The danger is that US legacies in Afghanistan will make the region unstable, that uh, the Southern actors, uh, the South Asian actors themselves would like to some extent have this sort of um, instability so that they could prove their mettle. So just to give a brief background, um, during the Cold War and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, it is well known that the Mujahideens benefited from the US weapons, including the portable shoulder fired uh, anti-aircraft system called the Stingers. In the 1986, uh, reformist Michael Gorbachev comes and then Najibullah becomes the leader of Afghanistan. However, he was facing constant sort of infighting among Mujahideens. Um, here, the rebellion between Uzbek and Tajik militia commanders, particularly Abdul Rashid Dostam and Rabani, is important. When Rabani refused to step down as leader of the Afghani government, it led to a series of political infighting where in the 1993-94, Afghani Islamic clerics and students, mostly of the rural Pashtun origin, formed the Taliban movement. And many were former Mujahideens, and they had moved to Pakistan to study in madrasas. With uh, Mullah Umar as a leader, Taliban quickly took control of Afghanistan, killed Najibullah. The rumor is that he was killed uh, with the assistance of the ISI in Pakistan. It led to the birth of Northern Alliance as an anti-Taliban force where now India played an important role. It included, among others, former Afghani President Rabbani, Ahmad Shah Massoud and Ismail Khan. Uh, there was also Dostam, Hazara Shias and Itihadi Islami, among other several actors. The point of all these is to show that there were multiple factions and infighting among several ethnic groups um, on, within Afghanistan itself. And with their own interests in maintaining regional stability, other actors like India, Pakistan, including China, Iran, and other, other actors in the region, played with these sort of multiple ethnic divisions within Afghanistan. So the geopolitics of other regional state is indeed part of the infighting of what happened in Afghanistan. India took sides in the Northern Alliance campaign against the Taliban. And of course, Pakistan at that time endorsed the Taliban and um, it recognized the Taliban along with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Therein lies the sort of game where any sort of infighting in another country led to a particular way of looking at the implications of these infighting for national security reasons of another country in the region. By the time of the September 11 attacks, the Taliban controlled at least 75% of the country, including almost all provincial capitals. Importantly, Northern Alliance was crumbling at this time. The withdrawal and the effective return of Taliban in 2021, with now Pakistan pleading for recognition of Taliban and now India's interest in an anti-Taliban sort of coalition or trying to manage uh, Taliban in the region somehow resonates with these sort of old images. But we don't have another Northern Alliance 2.0, which means the same geopolitical rules of the national security logics apply and states will try to now somehow invent itself and reinvent itself in order to understand how to manage their own sort of threats in Afghanistan or how to manage sort of dynamics within Afghanistan in order to manage their national security interests. When the United States sought to fight the Taliban through Operation Enduring Freedom, which later became Operation Freedom Sentinel, it was a state building project in Afghanistan. And this state building project was grafted onto a national security and understanding of the United States. The idea was that a strong state in Afghanistan can reduce factional infighting within Afghanistan, which in turn can reduce the links between Al-Qaeda and Taliban, which in turn the Americans believe that it will reduce terror attacks in the United States and in its partners. American state building effort therefore became some sort of a justification for its uh, massive killing of insurgents and terrorists through drone strikes. Similarly, the emphasis on sort of women's rights and human rights was important for uh, the United States administration in different capacities um, to show that uh, the Americans are indeed very different from the Taliban. 
Um, in fact, uh, now with the withdrawal of the United States from Afghanistan, and with this particular emphasis on drone strikes as the only way or one of the interesting and important ways in order to manage terrorists, no such framing on the importance of human rights or women's rights or, is necessary. What we see is that the return of American fight against terrorist outfits in Afghanistan without worrying about state building. This is indeed a welcome development to some extent for India, Pakistan, and China, where state building projects have always been problematic against insurgents and opposition. American withdrawal has effectively shown the importance of the old rule that when national security considerations dominate, it is okay to sideline questions relating to human rights with impunity. With liberal internationalism, and liberal interventionism thereafter, it was at least uh, showing, a, showing an idea that a framing of an issue as, as indeed concerned about human rights and indeed concerned about democracy promotion was important. But this liberal internationalism was itself complicit in the American national security discourse. Um, I'm not here arguing that the American intervention in Taliban did not do any sort of difference. It indeed um, was different from what happened with Taliban's Islamic, strict Islamic practices and how it publicly executed women for adultery. These uh, sort of things were slowly fading. Yet lessons of American withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan now and how Taliban is able to quickly recapture sort of territories brings back these sort of images. In other words, it is kind of too late to think that some of these sort of problems that we see is indeed a new problem. It is indeed old problems with new sort of light. And let me quickly elaborate on what are these sort of old rules that we're talking about. The United States defense reports um, on Afghanistan stability have repeatedly identified um, Afghanistan military stay safe havens in Pakistan as a threat to Afghanistan stability. Uh, and Pakistan indeed um, claims, or the Ministry of Defense in the United States claims that there are proxy forces in Afghanistan that are established um, by Pakistan in order to counter Indian influences. President Trump, there, therefore, in August 2017, quite explicitly said, we can no longer be silent about Pakistan's safe haven or for terrorist organizations, and that while in the past, Pakistan has been a valued partner. It is time for Pakistan to demonstrate its commitment to civilization, order, and peace. Now, the tension is, by framing this problem in the sort of a geopolitical struggle against who is right and who is wrong, it made it urgent for Pakistan to come to terms with Taliban once the American withdrawal was, was on, on the road. The old rule is that Pakistan should fight against India through a strategic depth. Uh, and therefore, reconciling with, with Taliban was important. This rule sort of is reinvented these days, particularly with uh, Pakistan pleading for the importance of rec recognizing or helping uh, Taliban, um, is that it, the claim of Pakistan is that it wants immediate development assistance to Afghanistan. Sanctions must be removed. Um, otherwise, Afghanistan will become a humanitarian disaster. Or Pakistan is concerned about people of Afghanistan, particularly refugees, drug trafficking, cross-border terrorism, and increase in food prices, among others. And the promise of Pakistan here is to say, we will deliver relief supplies and evacuate foreign nationals. Um, so for Pakistan, it is important that it, uh, it is able to engage with Taliban in a way to set the conversation going, so as to prove to both its own domestic audiences and to regional audiences and to international audiences that, Pakistan, that Taliban will moderate its policies um, if given assistance through the route to Pakistan. The problem is that almost all of these things are seen in the old sort of geopolitical rivalry issues between India and Pakistan. The reason for this tension, again, is that there is indeed another problem between Pakistan and Afghanistan in the Durant line. So Pakistan's intention to create more sort of relational uh, and relational engagement with the Taliban is to ensure that there are no ways of Afghanistan coming back to its sort of uh, problematic understanding of Durand line and creating sort of insurgents in that part of Pakistan. So rethinking of all these sort of state sovereignty, cartographic borders really comes back with vengeance. Um, so the real tension is to understand how these sort of old rules still gets perpetuated in new ways. Now let us look at the problems of India. 
India saw the hosting of um, or Afghanistan's Taliban's hosting of Al Qaeda between 1996 and 2001 as a major threat because of Al Qaeda's association with radical Islamist organizations, um, both in Pakistan but also across the region. And of course, these uh, groups have committed major acts of terrorism in India, including terrorist attacks in Mumbai in November 2008 and in July 2011. And for this reason, India's geopolitical interest right now is to cut across the sort of debates and then go straight into Pakistan, um, straight up outside Pakistan and talk directly to Afghanistan. It has invested three billion in development assistance, infrastructure development in the Salma Dam and Iran upon Kora highways. Um, and it has also provided education and capacity building. The problem is with this way of thinking, the idea of India is to say that we are going to stop the perception of strategic depth that Pakistan is having against India and to somehow we are going to manage India's relations with Afghanistan, which is a geopolitical sort of management in order to stop Pakistan from acquiring its sort of um, goals. India now opened with the withdrawal of uh, the United States, back channel communications with Taliban factions that is outside the sphere of Pakistan and Iran. The problem with such a thinking again is India's own sort of geopolitical insecurities about what happens in Kashmir, what happens with the sort of Muslim insurgents, what happens and how to deal with problematic sort of insurgent groups within Indian, India's own sort of domestic sort of setting. And this sort of withdrawal allows India to actually think back its own sort of rules now with new sort of ways. Let's look at China again. China is again concerned with questions of Afghanistan and uh, concerned with problems in, in Pakistan. The traditional sort of relationship between China and Pakistan as all weather friends is important to note. However, China is also concerned with Islamic militants who operate in Afghanistan to assist China's restive Uyghur Muslim community. The East Turkestan Islamic movement is an opposition group in China, some of whose operatives are based in Afghanistan. Thus, China in September 2012 uh, signed security and economic agreements, multiple sort of agreements uh, on, with Afghanistan. In 2012, China signed a series of agreements with Afghanistan, one of which promised Chinese training and funding for Afghanistan's policies. Then there is the Belt and Road initiatives, and after um, October 2014, China hosted Ashraf Ghani for bilateral meeting and as um, attendance at the heart of Asia Istanbul process conferences. The problem once again is the sort of China's geopolitical way of thinking about these sort of issues so as to think that the best way to resolve these sort of like tensions between India and Pakistan is to stop encirclement of of Pakistan by India and thus maintain the sort of geopolitical equations in the way that benefits China's calculations in Southern Asia. In other words, what we actually see with the return of um, or the withdrawal of Afghanistan is this return of similar insecurities by Pakistan, India and China with the same geopolitical logic. And that tension is what is actually driving the Southern Asian neighborhood in important ways. And in my sort of understanding, I think this is going to drive a particularly important and problematic way of looking at statecraft. This is important because um, India um, amended the 1955 Citizenship Act. And it, by offering uh, sort of this amendment is important and interesting because India was concerned about refugees in the neighborhood. But by amending the Citizenship Act, it said Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, Parsis, and Christians would be allowed to be sick, uh, seeking citizenship uh, from the region. And in other words, it marginalized Muslims. Um, the bill was passed in the upper house of the parliament um, by 125 votes to 105 on 11 December 2019. Whereas the old Indian citizenship laws prohibits blanket wise illegal immigrants from becoming Indian citizens, the new bill created exceptions for Hindu, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, Parsis, and Christians by sidelining Muslims as the sort of problematic actors. It also enshrines, in other words, religious discrimination into law. Um, the problem with this sort of view is again uh, comprehended or complemented by India's change in status of Kashmir position and this new way of thinking about the role of Kashmir in India as one and only contributing to India's strength as unity of India. The fear is that India 
believes that with the, with the return of sort of Taliban, Pakistan's support for Haqqani network is going to increase, and this is going to lead to particular ways of new terror attacks in India. The problem, again, is a sort of a geopolitical thinking without any ways to move out of this sort of framework to believe that different communities in India have different ways of living and coexisting that a particular strong state cannot avoid. And we saw the same with China's sort of plans um, in its sort of emphasis on geopolitics, both in, in its emphasis on asking the Afghanistan to recognize China's claims in the South China Sea, as well as in China's emphasis on Belt and Road initiatives as a one important way to really reconnect the region. China's emphasis on CPEC is one way to actually keep continuing its relationship with Pakistan. The problem again is the sort of this geopolitical view is, is inhibiting these states to really rethink sort of problems in American withdrawal from Afghanistan. As I started this presentation, American withdrawal in Afghanistan rests on the idea that it is possible to step out of state, state building as a project because of the promises of technology. They would not stop, in other words, to attack and kill uh, terrorists and other problematic actors whom they believe as insurgents. Uh, the idea is that they would not now have to graft state building with technology, well, with the sort of justifications as human rights on the one hand and killing on the other. They could, in fact, engage in killing with impunity. But with geopolitical actors in such as India, Pakistan, and China, returning to the same old rules of geopolitics means that they will have to reconcile to the fact of American technological dominance and to some extent reconciling to the fact of how America's American way of um, eliminating enemies through technology is probably the best way in order to actually build their own states. So the problem, I believe, with the sort of uh, the, the withdrawal of the United States from Afghanistan is this return of geopolitical thinking in important ways that not only kind of challenges um, India, Brazil, uh, sorry, India, China, and Pakistan's notion uh, that they have to rethink international politics in different ways. It reinforces the geopolitical notion and in important ways. And I would uh, stop my presentation here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that's talk about complex. Um, so uh, unlike Bamo, you didn't mention Iran, um, nor did you mention any positive prospects of change from within Afghanistan. And I just wonder, could you say something about that to, to start us off? Yes, um, with, with, with regard to Iran, I think Iran wants to definitely protect uh, Shia and Persian sort of uh, population in Afghanistan. I did not talk a lot about Iran precisely because I thought Bamu is going to cover the sort of debate. And uh, Taliban's and, and, and Pashtun Taliban fighters, and then there is this Iran's support for Shia fighters on the one hand, which is a non, so the, I, I think the reason why I didn't touch on Iran's problem is because of the tensions with which Iran looks at this sort of neighborhood, which I couldn't quite clearly capture, and it's not part of the Southern Asian sort of um, framework. But I think the sort of problems that come from India, Pakistan, and China in the Southern Asian region does not bode well in terms of optimism, as Bamo would talk about in terms of the optimism that happens in in Iraq, precisely because these are state building projects with particular hopes about how states must exercise its sort of power. Hmm. But in terms of, so is your argument basically that this region, this country, Afghanistan, which has had such tragic history, at least in the last 50 years or so, is just set to continue because of the return of geopolitics, that there actually is no, there's no way out, there's no there is no one in the region interested in stability in Afghanistan. Yes, I think I would, I would. That's a nice way to put it, and I think that is how I believe as well. There is the the understanding that with the American withdrawal from Afghanistan, the region is somehow coming back to its old roots, where the region will sign up find its own solutions is problematic in many ways, because much of the actors in the South Asian regions are quite complicit in actually maintaining the sort of instability in Afghanistan in order to perpetuate these state projects. Hmm. Well, that's very bleak indeed. Now, we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A, and I should say uh, your fellow panelists uh, should feel free to uh, raise their hand and unmute and ask questions if you would like. So. 
just uh, if you wish. Uh, there's a question from Nadim Khan uh, for you, Sashi, who asks, okay. would, a, would a plebiscite in Kashmiri and Pashtun areas resolve the Indo-Pak and Afghan-Pak conflicts? Wow. <laughs> I think that is a long sort of problem with regard to how to conduct plebiscite in Kashmir and how the very understanding of plebiscite itself is, is written with with the question of how to understand India-Pakistan rivalry. So the notion that a thought experiment where the plebiscite between India or plebiscite and Kashmir would somehow resolve these problems is, is moot or it is a problematic because of the change in the status of Kashmir already by what India has done. So there's no opportunity anymore to have a plebiscite and return to status quo ante because things have changed so far. Right. Okay, we have a, a question from a uh, question, quite a long question from my very good friend, a very good friend of the webinar, uh, Abid Ali as well. Uh, he says the Pakistan relationship is not just driven by geopolitical consideration, it is multidimensional. Just taking two aspects, Pashtuns are the largest ethnic group in Afghanistan and the creators of the Afghan state in the early 1700s, but their numbers are not even half of the 40 million Pashtuns that live in Pakistan on this side of the Durand line. Furthermore, Pakistan not only facilitates Afghan transit trade, the use of its ports, but is also its largest supplier of everything from food to construction supplies. Therefore, Pakistan can't disengage from Afghanistan and ignore the interests of the Pashtuns on both sides, which is a bit of a red herring, he says. So how does it balance this with a bi its bilateral relationship with other stakeholders like US, China, Iran, and even India? This is a fair point, I think, but um, when when I mean, um, when Karzai wanted to create a sort of a new economic relations between Afghanistan and India, it was from it was rejected by India at that time precisely because of the tensions flagged um, here um, by by this audience. Um, I think this notion that Pakistan is engaging in Pakistan is somehow forced to engage in Afghanistan because of its notion to protect the sort of Pashtun community is itself a sort of a narrative in order to keep this sort of Pakistan's engagement with Afghanistan going. If Pakistan is not concerned with the Durand line and uh, the geopolitical problems of how to really manage issues of refugees from Afghanistan, um, how to manage questions of uh, uh, terrorist outfits in Afghanistan having its um, or attacking um, Pakistan, then there is no need for Pakistan to actually or play this narrative about the importance of Pashtuns. So the notion of Pashtun is not done in an altruistic manner. It is actually, in other words, to reinforce sort of its geopolitical goals, both in the South Asian region to protect its own sort of borders in the Durand line with Afghanistan, as well as to actually create a strategic depth against India. That's how I kind of see. Okay, thank you, uh, Sashi. I've got a question from Sean Stars who thanks you for your talk and says that basically you're saying that even after the US withdrawal, there's little prospects for stability in Afghanistan because of the regional powers filling the vacuum with their own great game. Or to put it another way, are you saying that there can't be peace in Afghanistan without peace between India and China and India and Pakistan? And what, what, might, what might be the prospects of such peace? Mm -hmm. I think prognostication and predicting what's going to happen in the sort of future is, is a problem. But what I am really saying is that there is indeed uh, less prospect for stability in Afghanistan due to the lack of regional powers playing an important role. The reason why they don't want to play an important role is because of the inherent geopolitical tensions that regional powers already have. So in other words, just to believe that Afghanistan will be stable only if India, Pakistan or India and China will resolve their boundary disputes would be sort of far-fetched because these countries is, are going to take forever to have their sort of rivalries resolved. Hmm. Problem is they wanted to have an unstable sort of um, situations in the South Asian region so as to reinvent themselves as great powers. In, indeed, India's quest for great power status and, uh, and China's sort of quest for great power status rests on the notion that we can be managers of problems in our sort of neighborhood. So the notion that China and some China and India can somehow resolve its problem first and then come to Afghanistan is sort of problematic. Hmm. Right. That's 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 a very bleak situation. So, I mean, what? So what's the solution for people who live in Afghanistan itself? 
you know, and what are the prospects of that? I mean, Afghanistan, you know, you talk about China, India, uh, Pakistan, and so on. And that, those rivalries and those border disputes have been going on for many, many decades, well before Afghanistan's current phase of, you know, tragedy and so on. Um, and Afghanistan had degrees of stability, greater levels of stability, and some level of progress uh, for its own population before as well. So why is it then that, 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 so that at least some, some understanding of Afghanistan as a, if Afghanistan, if Afghanistan is a kind of contested territory, then is there no prospect that there could be some sort of peace agreement or at least a non-conflict agreement uh, which would enable Afghanistan at least to sort of progress somewhat towards serving its own population. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, but the non-conflict agreement has to come from those groups from on the ground, particularly those factions fighting against each other, and particularly those different sort of hmm. um, groups, that those having inheritance from the Mujahideen on the one hand, or different Islamic factions on ground who has to come to terms with finding sort of an amicable, reasonable way to like move on. If there is no sort of ground level sort of reconciliation, then for, perhaps it is extremely difficult to find sort of exogenous solutions to those problems in Afghanistan. And that is why peace there could be sort of very fragile. And this also requires us to somehow think that is it possible to somehow think of Afghanistan and the problems beyond the sort of like state center, centric cartographic understanding of what sort of solutions do we need? The, the sort of like confining Pakistan, Afghanistan into this one sort of territory and letting the sort of groups decide among themselves will be okay for the Americans unless and until they would use their sort of territory to fund terrorist campaigns that will hit the United States or its partner countries. So that is what we are exactly seeing these days where the effective American withdrawal from Afghanistan is to say, well, you guys resolve the problems yourself. <laughs> Problem is, I think the actors within Afghanistan themselves have to, have to reconcile to this fact and come to terms in understanding that the best way to actually think about resolving problems and engaging in sort of a better way to look at the future role of Afghanistan, both in the region and in the world, is to resolve their problems themselves. So if the United States is left and if it cannot engage in state building in Afghanistan, um, it cannot be a vacuum that could be filled by either China or India or even Pakistan, precisely because all these powers are sort of external to what is happening within the sort of internal dynamics within the states. Just one final question, if I may. Um, just in terms of the, the internal political forces in Afghanistan itself. So could you just say a little bit about what are the, what are the different contending forces and how powerful are they in relation to one another and to what extent do they align themselves with a national policy and to what extent are any significant forces aligned with a foreign of a foreign power or foreign sponsor okay i think um there, there, there is a problem of foreign sponsors, particularly with the rise of the um, Islamic State and the sort of different sort of vaccinations mm -hmm. among the sort of people within Afghanistan to find affiliations with um, the Islamic State. However, there is the largest ethnic group of Pashtuns on the one hand, but there is also the Hazaras and the Tajiks who play an important role, particularly in the sort of like the, the formation of the government who, during the Karzai, uh, Amit Karzai's time. Um, but we should also remember that at some point of time, Dostum fled to Turkey uh, in May 2017, and he came back in July um, 2017, but he was blocked by these sort of internal factions to come back to his sort of, um, come back to Afghanistan to play an important role. So new coalitions are formed, not just in and within Afghanistan, but also outside here, Turkey is an example. So this sort of coalition that Dostem sort of created was formed in um, Turkey, where Dostem's Uzbek majority played an important role um, that challenged um, Ashburghani's sort of authority in important ways. So these sort of factions from Uzbeks to Hazaras, to Tajiks, to Pashtuns, to um, the uh, Islamic State within the Afghanistan, to sort of coalitions that are forming 
beyond the state, particularly in Iran or Turkey or other parts of countries, play an important role because they all have a vision for what they want to be sort of the future of Afghanistan. And now with sort of Taliban playing an important role in sort of homogenizing the country in terms of understanding this is what it is going to be in terms of strict Islamic sort of uh, uh, principles, then perhaps these sort of uh, other groups that are marginalized from, from the Hazaras to the Tajiks who will eventually face some sort of discrimination, including the Baha'i people who follow the Baha'i religion in Afghanistan are treated as treated by the Taliban as sort of uh, blasphemous. So these members should, in fact, come together to make an idea about what is the best way to oppose sort of uh, the, the role of Taliban. So th there are indeed multiple sort of grouping within Afghanistan. So the Taliban's portrayal of Afghanistan is that there are no sort of legitimate sort of groupings. Uh, it's either sort of problematic Pashtuns or including there are Pashtun supporters. Uh, for the Taliban, but that is not the case. The sort of important groupings within the country um, are indeed sort of playing an important role to think about alternatives for the country. Just so one last, last question for you, because you do deal with Brazil as well, and mm -hmm. therefore have regional knowledge of Latin and uh, South America and so on. Um, and I just wonder, going with what Bama was talking about in terms of Iraq as a battleground, real geopolitics and many other kinds of politics going on as well. And now you talk about Afghanistan and you talked about this term new wars, where basically remote warfare uh, is a substitute for geopolitical warfare or for nation building. Are you, are you saying, I mean, then we have the example of, of Yemen where there are contending forces from outside and within uh, causing death and mayhem and chaos there too. Uh, we have the case of Venezuela where there's deep instabilities being promoted from within and without with various kinds of alliances as well, contending forces, Russia, China, and the United States and probably others too, uh, Cuba maybe. Um, so do you see any kind of a, is, there a, is that a new pattern of uh, what the future holds in contested regions and contested strategic states? I think so, because uh, as long as sort of great powers try to stop interfering in other sort of countries, particularly in deciding what factions that they have to support or they must support in terms of making choices, then perhaps these factions, and I'm idealistic here, would try to resolve problems with themselves. So um, the United States or Russia's sort of support for Taliban is precisely because of the justification they give is because of the problem of the Islamic State. Mm -hmm. And Americans think to some extent Russia is exaggerating the problem of Islam, threat of Islamic State in Afghanistan. So when great powers to a large extent are deciding what factions to support and how, be it in sort of Afghanistan or Yemen or Venezuela, or in any other parts of, parts of the world, then we inevitably have much more resources coming to one sort of factions deciding what's the best way to move forward. So we are indeed seeing this sort of great power involvement with a much more sort of intensity of what factions to support, which groups to support, how do we frame our support to a particular sort of faction if they are sort of talking about human rights protection or women's protection, even at the face level without actually committing to those sort of principles. And if this is indeed the case, then we'll see much more sort of active groups forming in many different parts of the world with uh, great powers playing an important role in taking sides on these sort of uh, factions. There's a book project there for you, Sashi, I think in the answer that you just gave. Thank you so much. I mean, talk about complicated, but so interesting as well. And uh, not to mention very, very tragic for for both the countries which are the focus of, of your talks, uh, Obama and, uh, and Sashi. But thank you so much for your illuminating discussion, talk and Q&A as well. There are other questions for you on the Q&A, which I haven't disappeared. So you might want to have a look at those a little bit later on. But we, as usual, we don't have enough time to ask all the really even more interesting questions, but we do want to move on to our third speaker. And thank you, Maria, uh, Maria Ryan from Nottingham, um, uh, yeah, you're up. You have time to speak about US grand strategy after the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Thanks so much, Indijit. Um, it's good to see you and all the other panelists and special thanks to Bamo for the invitation and Javaria for organizing. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. I'm gonna talk about uh, US grand strategy 
after Afghanistan and where it might go. And I, I want to start by thinking about the fall of Kabul. I think the fall of Kabul was was a massive blow to, to US soft power. The manner in which the US left Afghanistan, I think, caused huge reputational damage. Uh, Biden was criticized even by those who supported his decision to, to leave Afghanistan. And the evacuation was unilateral uh, in the sense that there was very little coordination with US allies. Uh, in terms of the actual decision to withdraw, which was taken in the Trump years uh, and was fully accepted by Biden, uh, and also the timeline for withdrawal. And the, the organization of, of the withdrawal was abysmal. Um, there was little to no planning for how to assist Afghans who'd, who'd worked with the US, whose lives were at risk uh, from a Taliban takeover. And the final fall of Kabul uh, to the Taliban, I think, signaled an unqualified defeat for the US in uh, its longest ever war. And those images of Kabul airport are indelible, uh, just as the images of, of the US leaving its Saigon embassy in 1975 were. And we still look back at those images from 1975 with shock, I think. And I suspect the same will be true of, of the images from Kabul airport as well. So the, the manner of the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, I think, undermined the country's soft power, but soft power is intangible. Uh, soft power is about reputation uh, and legitimacy. And I'm not sure that the reputational damage incurred specifically by the Afghan withdrawal will, will necessarily lead to any significant material consequences for American power. I think despite the reputational damage, I would say that traditional US alliances are still on a firmer footing than they were in the Trump years. Um, because US allies in, in Europe and in the Indo-Pacific, I think, recognize that Biden had come to view Afghanistan as, as a liability. So the US mission was no longer seen as defending a core interest. However, I think the Euro-Atlantic world and the Indo-Pacific are very much core areas of, of US interest under Biden. And I think that is widely understood uh, by both allies and um, adversaries and the botched withdrawal from Afghanistan doesn't change that. I think the Biden administration did more damage to its alliances by signing um, the so-called AUKUS, AUKUS agreement, Australia, US, UK uh, agreement, which uh, of course undercut France's relationship with Australia in, in a way that I think will not be forgotten quickly uh, in Paris and is likely to lead to, to even greater calls for, for European strategic autonomy from President Macron. But I think for the most part, um, the material basis of US power remains intact. The US continues to spend more on defense than its next 11 closest rivals combined. It has about 750 military bases around the world. It has the world's reserve currency, uh, for which there is currently no viable alternative. It leads an unparalleled network of global alliances. So even in the face of rising Chinese power, uh, the US remains a, a global superpower, I think. That doesn't mean that nothing has changed uh, in the wake of Afghanistan. I, even though the material basis of American power remains intact, I think the experience in Afghanistan has affected US views on uh, the utility of force and what force should be used for. And the disenchantment with the Afghan war really predates the withdrawal by years, I think. And there is a widespread belief now, uh, bipartisan belief, uh, that it was a mistake to elevate militarized nation building um, to a core US objective. And uh, I don't want to um, I don't want to overplay the historical com um, comparisons because there isn't an exact parallel, I don't think, but it is kind of similar to the post-Vietnam period. Um, after Vietnam, the US was reluctant to engage in major ground wars uh, or nation building projects for three decades, uh, and there is no public uh, appetite for major ground wars now, so we are much less likely to see those uh, over the next decade or so. However, that does not mean uh, that the US will turn inwards or be isolationist or that its global strategy will eschew militarism. 
Uh, I think it will eschew nation building and counterinsurgency, but it will not necessarily be pacific as in peaceful. Uh, there will be a reluctance to, to put troops on the ground, but that doesn't mean there'll be no militarism. I think instead, uh, US grand strategy from, from now on um, will be defined by uh, open competition with China uh, or extreme competition as Biden has, has called it. And this competition is military, it's political, it's geopolitical, technological, uh, ideological uh, and economic. Um, the US-China competition uh, and the broader struggle uh, for influence across the Indo-Pacific, I think is the major legacy of the Trump administration uh, in foreign affairs. I think if you go back to um, you know, Obama's final year in office, arguably counter-terrorism uh, and the wars associated with it were still the central organizing principle or one of the main organizing principles for US foreign policy. But in the Trump years, counter-terrorism was displaced by competition with China. Uh, as the new organizing principle of US national security. And there is a very strong bipartisan consensus now in Washington that confronting China is the major foreign policy challenge for the US now and probably for the next generation. Um, the Biden administration's China strategy and its wider Indo-Pacific strategy, I believe are currently still under review uh, and have been for several months now. Um, the review was initially expected to report in July or August, uh, but I believe it's still ongoing. Um, it's led by the Department of Defense, but it's interagency in scope. And when that strategy is finalized, we will have, um, I think, a fuller appreciation of, of how the Biden administration intends to proceed. But it, it certainly so far seems to be the case that uh, there will be a lot of continuity between Trump and Biden in this respect. Um, we can see this in, in many ways. We can see the continuation of the so-called tech war, the technology war, um, the sanctions on Huawei and over 150 of its affiliate companies around the world uh, in order to prevent the transfer of dual-use communications technology um, to Chinese companies and ultimately to the Chinese military, or that's certainly how US officials see it anyway. Um, related to this, the uh, Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, or CFIUS for short, was reformed uh, in 2018 by an act of Congress, so it's permanent. Uh, the reform was designed basically to prevent most kinds of Chinese investment in the US tech sector. Uh, and uh, the legislation specifically targets, quote, countries of special concern that have a demonstrated or declared strategic goal of acquiring a type of critical technology or critical infrastructure that would affect United States leadership in areas related to national security. So that is something that um, can only be changed by more uh, legislation, but uh, it was very strongly supported by, by both parties in, in 2018. Biden also signed uh, an executive order in June this year that strengthened uh, an order signed by Trump last November, which bans uh, transactions in securities of any company that operates uh, in the defense or surveillance technology sector of the Chinese economy. Uh, so that, of course, is, is ongoing. The AUKUS agreement with uh, the UK and Australia um, was obviously anti-China, I think, um, despite the fact that all the signatories say that it wasn't actually directed against any particular country. I think it's fairly clear that it was directed against China. Um, Biden has been quite hawkish on Taiwan as well. Uh, it's, it's been reported that he is seriously considering a request from Taiwan uh, to change the name of its uh, its representative office in Washington. Um, it's currently called the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office, and they want to change it to the Taiwan Representative Office, which of course, of course um, China would not be very happy about the, the reference to Taiwan. The meetings of the, um, the Indo-Pacific Quad have continued um, the so-called quadrilateral security dialogue uh, between the US, India, Australia and Japan. Um, again, despite what the participants say, um, 
obviously directed against China and I think interpreted as anti-China uh, in Beijing. Biden hosted a, a virtual summit of, of the Quad leaders in March. US complaints about um, China's alleged unfair economic practices have continued as well. Um, and Biden has also, um, he's connected the confrontation with China to his domestic goals. Biden campaigned for office, um, espousing a somewhat more progressive, uh, more Keynesian uh, economic vision, including uh, a kind of industrial strategy uh, which would uh, promote investment in future technologies like artificial intelligence uh, and 5G, uh, which would enable the US to, um, to outcompete China and at the same time would, would promote uh, an economy that was more inclusive and um, environmentally sustainable. And he's, he is attempting to pass legislation uh, to this effect at the moment. Um, I think the best example that we have of this so far is the um, Innovation and Competition Act, which passed, uh, which uh, Congress passed in June this year, and it included $54 billion uh, specifically to increase the production of semiconductors and microchips inside the US. Now this, um, this desire, US desire to, to be the, the resident power, uh, the dominant outside power uh, in the Pacific world, uh, obviously is nothing new. You can easily trace it back uh, to the late 19th century when the US first acquired colonies in the Pacific Ocean. Um, and certainly since World War II, uh, the US has been the hegemonic power in Indo-Pacific. But what I think is new now is that American power is being challenged in the Pacific for the first time, um, really since the Japanese imperial regime uh, in the late 1930s. And so far, I think the US reaction to this suggests that it is not willing to accommodate China's rise. And I think the, the chief goal of US global strategy for the foreseeable future will be to resist the rise of Chinese power as much as possible and build up American national power at home and abroad. There is a very solid, elite level consensus uh, that the US must now resist the rise of China uh, and resist what US officials see, uh, rightly or wrongly, as China's attempts to export its, its own economic model, particularly through the Belt and Road Initiative. And the focus of this competition, I think, will, will be the Indo-Pacific, uh, where the US wants to remain um, the partner of choice uh, it wants to set regional political and economic norms, but I think that there will also be a, a global dimension to this competition. The US will probably seek to, to prevent countries in Europe, for example, from deepening their relationship with China in certain ways. A good example of this would be uh, the way that the Trump administration forced the UK to reverse its inclusion of Huawei in the UK's 5G consortium. Uh, as a result of US sanctions on Huawei, Huawei is no longer able to do what it promised the UK that it would do. So those sanctions, um, whatever you think of them from, from a US perspective, they were extremely effective. But there are a few caveats um, to this new grand strategy. It's, it's not all about uh, competition. The first caveat, I think, concerns the climate. The US wants to decouple climate change from all other issues in the US-China relationship. John Kerry, the um, Biden administration's climate czar, referred to climate change as, quote, a critical standalone issue on which we have to deal. So the US wants to be able to negotiate um, with China on climate change. And I, I wonder whether um, the way that the US negotiated with uh, the Soviet Union on arms control in the early 1970s um, might be a model of uh, the kind of negotiation that the US has in mind with another great power over an issue that is viewed as an existential threat. But I, I'm not sure that this is going to be very successful um, because the US is going to keep doing things that really irritate the Chinese 
um, you know, for example, on Taiwan and the South China Sea. So I think the question really is, will the U will China let the US decouple climate from all other issues, or will it insist that uh, progress on climate is conditional on uh, changes in the US approach to the South China Sea, say? Um, and does it matter if if these two countries don't operate closely uh, on climate, will this lead to lesser commitments uh, at COP26, for example? Uh, it's very hard to say, I think. The second caveat uh, to this grand strategy of competition concerns financial and uh, commercial interdependence. There is not going to be a full scale uh, commercial decoupling between the US and China. The Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo, was asked about this in September, and she said, there's no point in talking about decoupling. It's too big of an economy, meaning China's economy is too big, and um, both sides want access uh, to markets in non-sensitive goods. So there will still be um, restrictions on trade and transactions in dual-use technology, but I think this is unlikely to signify a wider economic decoupling. And similarly, uh, China remains the second largest sovereign holder of American treasury bonds in the world, uh, and it has been for over a decade. And it, it's, it's simply not in China's interest uh, to sell off uh, these bonds en masse because it would, um, it would devalue China's other dollar denominated assets. And the US will, will continue to sell these bonds because uh, it's going to continue to have high budget deficits for the foreseeable future and it needs to generate more income somehow. Uh, so financial interdependence will continue. So I think that the, um, the US-China relationship, it's, it will be characterized by both competition and interdependence. Now, Graham Allison has uh, written the landmark book uh, asking whether the US and China can escape um, what he calls the Thucydides trap. Uh, can they avoid going to war? And certainly after Afghanistan and Iraq, the American public appears to be sick of uh, major ground wars, the so-called forever wars. There is very little appetite for a major ground war. And I think even at an elite level, there would be some opposition to this. Um, but at the same time, the, the US um, strategy towards China, it does entail uh, militarism and military competition. And there are two serious potential military flashpoints in the region, uh, Taiwan and, and the South China Sea. And although um, official US policy on Taiwan uh, is uh, strategic ambiguity, I think at an elite level, there is a very strong commitment to defending Taiwan, although exactly how is, is unstated. And there's also a very strong commitment uh, to defending freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. And that is something that the US does already routinely. So although uh, the Biden administration campaign, or Biden, I should say, campaign for office, um, critical of the so-called forever wars, I think his administration is, is likely to continue with uh, actions that are highly provocative to China. So this new grand strategy is kind of pulling in different directions. Uh, on the one hand, you have interdependence and the, the open pursuit of commercial and uh, financial interdependence, which makes war unthinkable because it would be wealth destroying. But on the other hand, um, as China seeks more influence in its, um, in its neighborhood. Uh, there is the potential for military confrontation, I think, in, in the South China Sea or the Taiwan Strait. So the relationship, I think, be between the two countries um, is very complex and multifaceted. There are areas of, of pragmatic cooperation uh, alongside non-military competition and military competition and de deterrence. And that relationship is going to define US global strategy for a generation now, I think. Now, obviously, my conclusions uh, are rather preliminary because um, we're still in the, in the early stages of, of this new global strategy. But 
based on what we've seen so far of this um, extreme competition with China, uh, it seems to me that, you know, one of the flaws in the US approach is the belief that it can resist the rise of China, it can prevent China from dominating its own region of the world, and that the US itself can remain the, the dominant power in the Indo-Pacific for another generation. And that, I think, is the ultimate goal of the US strategy. But at the moment, um, you know, the American people are, are disinclined to support major conflict. That's the legacy of Afghanistan. And it may have an impact on the future of, of US strategy in the Indo-Pacific. Um, it, it's hard to imagine, for example, that Americans would view the defense of, say, Taiwan as a core vital interest in the way that um, the Chinese people would uh, and do. And I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh... Uh, Maria, it's really interesting. Just to uh, just to start off the questions, <clears throat> the first two talks obviously were Iraq and Afghanistan, and your talk began with the the chaotic, at the very least, chaotic departure of the U.S. Uh, from uh, from Afghanistan. So, what is now? So for Bamo, he was talking about U.S. aid and other forces doing various kinds of uh, carrying out various kinds of activities or programs in Iraq. Uh, Sashi was talking about the kind of tech warfare or remote warfare, drone warfare, as the kind of the tactic to be used, not nation building or anything like that. So is that what the US sort of view now, the dominant view is that those two areas can effectively be left largely to themselves and they that the US will effectively try to contain in various ways uh, what they can by drone strikes in the in the Iraq case and maybe sorry in the Afghanistan case and maybe in the Iraq case with a combination of some um, so-called soft power aid or whatever as well as uh, opposition to ISIS and so on is that what they're seeking to do is just to manage what goes on in that those regions because the the China issue is now in effect, that is the kind of generational um, conflict or generational relationship that they're looking to to try to sort of come to terms with. That is definitely my impression, Indajit. Yes, I, I think the policy elite in the US has just moved on from Afghanistan and Iraq, I think. Um, and the public are fed up of, you know, the so-called forever wars. And um, I think there, there are still obviously some un unanswered questions about exactly what US policy uh, towards Afghanistan and, and Pakistan and Iraq will be. But I think, you know, my impression is that Biden wants to rely on a kind of over the horizon military capability. Um, they've actually already done, they've already used this in Afghanistan um, after one of the suicide bombings, although they didn't have very good intelligence and um, didn't target the people who are responsible. Um, but, but I suspect that, that the US goal will be uh, counter-terrorism very narrowly defined uh, to be achieved through drone strikes, through the use of a, an over the horizon military capability. There is already a kind of quasi-legal framework in place, um, dating back to the Obama years, uh, for conducting drone strikes outside of, of war zones. And I believe that Biden is currently reviewing that framework. Mm. But I, I don't think there is any interest whatsoever in um, state building in Afghanistan uh, or Iraq. Um, the, the foreign policy discourse, I think, in Washington is just so dominated by China now, and it's bipartisan, um, you know, in, in a very polarized town where there's not much agreement on anything, you know, I think the two parties really are agreed um, that the, the competition with China is, you know, a, a, like a generational um, competition. I mean, I was really interested to hear Bamo say that, um, you know, th this this is the time now uh, for the US to kind of rectify the mistakes that it made in Iraq. You know, that, that moment is now and there's an opportunity for them to do this now. And um, you talked about, you know, a New Deal-esque policy for Iraq. Um, I, I just feel that um, the, the policy elite in, in Washington and the US Congress has just moved on 
from Afghanistan uh, and Iraq, and they're kind of obsessed with with China, I think. Hmm. Okay, thank you, um, Maria. Lots of lots of interesting uh, questions coming up uh, in the uh, Q and A. Uh, Sean Stars, thanks you uh, for your talk, uh, and apologizes for the length of his uh, intervention as well. I think you probably already answered the question about soft power by saying that it actually doesn't really matter that much that the Euro-Atlantic and Indo-Pacific kind of strategies and allies remain quite strong. Um, and, and Sean agrees that, you know, the, the Japan and Germany still want uh, the US hegemony, if you like, um, just as they did in 2010s when WikiLeaks and Snowden revealed that US was tapping phones of allied leaders, kidnapping EU citizens, sending them to black sites for torture, etc. Um, allied states know that the US does. Uh, as a Japanese diplomat said, China is now learning how ruthless the US can be when its power is challenged, but they choose to follow US hegemony because it protects and expands global capitalism from which all those allies benefit. So, so in a way, he's kind of reinforcing to some extent the point that you, you were making, that the US has come out. Yeah, it didn't look, it was a bad look but the damage in real material terms of the so-called chaos, well, it was chaos, uh, wasn't very great, especially as the US public opinion wanted the US doubt as well. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, just to say that um, I I do agree with, with Sean um, that, um, you know, core US allies, um, actually welcome um, US leadership because they benefit from it. And um, I, I don't think that they were particularly upset by the manner of the US withdrawal from Afghanistan. They were kind of irritated that they weren't consulted a bit more, I think, uh, and that there wasn't more coordination, but um, I don't think they opposed the withdrawal at all. Got a question from a good old friend of ours, a mutual friend, uh, Oz Hassan from Warwick who says, is it not the case that China is a useful macro global ordering enemy, inflated because it's useful at home, and the Middle East is simply regional stuff? Is that what's really being reflected in their grand strategy? That is kind of China now as a threat serves a large number of interests. Uh, and in a way, what you said, Maria, was interesting because you talked about the, the different levels of relationship, the different kinds of US-Chinese relationships in different areas. So economy, finance, markets, you know, investments and so on, uh, qualified for tech, which has military or security uh, implications, but that actually the relationship in practice is actually pretty strong. All the brickwork is still there, but the security elements are now being kind of tampered with and altered uh, to se secure this, but could it be just this, this is China is not really a threat because it has no alternative ideology. It has no uh, Warsaw Pact. It, it has no communist parties or pro-Chinese communist parties around the world inside the politics of the West or anywhere else. That it, it's, it's not the Soviet Union. Uh, that the, in fact, this, so the China threat is an inflation strategy Maybe the Pentagon, you know, in its demand for continued supremacy and so on. So what, you know, I just wondered if you could perhaps deal with uh, with Oz's. Well, I, I would agree with you that, that the China threat is definitely inflated, but um, I'm, I'm not, I'm actually not convinced mm. that US officials and members of Congress uh, are, are doing it deliberately. I think they do really believe that China's intention is to uh, challenge the quote unquote liberal international order, uh, not, not to integrate into it, but actually to challenge it and ultimately to replace it um, and to spread a different economic model through the Belt and Road, I think. Um, and they're acting on that basis um, we can argue over whether their perceptions are accurate. And, and I think, um, you know, that my view is, is that they, they are exaggerating the threat from China. Um, and it probably is uh, that, you know, there are people who benefit from that. But, but I think there is a very strong belief that, that China's intention is, um, you know, to, to challenge the US-led global order. 
Um, there used to be a debate, you know, if you go back even into the Obama years, there was a debate about whether, um, you know, Ch China um, could potentially be integrated into the global order or whether it was trying to replace the US led order. And, and I think now that that debate has ended in Washington and there is a bipartisan consensus um, that, the, that China uh, does not want to integrate into the US led order and is consciously trying to build an alternative and to displace the US from the Indo-Pacific. And that, those are the premises that inform um, the US approach to China at the moment, I think. I mean, just going back to that, uh, I remember January 2017 when President Xi turned up at Davos supporting globalization, uh, supporting liberal globalization in a way, uh, as opposed to Amer Trump's America firstism and so on. So I just wonder whether it's actually, I mean, okay, perceptions of American elites and so on are very powerful in all sorts of ways, and they're going to have consequences. But in a way, do you not believe that uh, that effectively the U it may not be the liberal international order which the U Chinese are opposing? It's the U.S. bit of the leadership of the order. That is to say, that maybe their argument is that actually the liberal order has done. They've done very well out of the liberal order. The Chinese, they have got this sort of worldwide investment strategy, markets, uh, resources, and raw materials. They're integrated into World Bank, IMF, and other things. Where they weren't being in integrated, uh, they've set up some alternative parallel uh, and uh, rival structures. But actually, is this really sort of the next phase of the international economic and financial systems in which China is going to have a far greater role, as are other powers as well, and that really is the US is trying to preserve its position in that order and prevent it from changing too radically, uh, rather than China's trying to you know, dis, sort of get rid of the order itself. I just wonder if you, know, if you could comment on that. Well, I'm very much in agreement with you. Uh, I, I think um, my impression is that Chinese officials are quite clear eyed about the way, about the, um, the benefits they've had from from the the US led order but they do want a greater say in how it's run now but i think the mistake that US officials are making is um that they're assuming that china is challenging the entire order and that they want to replace the order with something that is chinese led i'm not suggesting that that US officials are, officials are right to think that actually i think they're wrong um but that I think is the basis of US strategy at the moment, this new strategy that we're seeing unfolding. I, you know, I think it is premised on a belief that China is actually trying to displace the US from the Indo-Pacific, to eject the US from the Indo-Pacific, and that it's trying to build its own order, its own economic order uh, that will be built on different principles and that ideally will, will displace the liberal international order. I don't think that's what China is actually trying to do, but that is what US officials think it is trying to do. Yeah, you mentioned um, uh, Graham Allison and that book. Um, premised as usual on the kind of this particular one of realism, which I mean, I've read, I've read that literature and that book quite closely. Um, and they, they come as close to predicting inevitable war, interhegemonic war, as you can probably come. And they, they, Stephen Walt and others also, they talk about the wisest possible leadership, which is required to, to sort of uh, avert any kind of major conflict. And it strikes me as incredibly ahistorical because you, first of all, you mentioned that even the US under Biden is talking about climate change as something outside of the conflict and the competition. And the other thing, of course, is, is that in effect, you've got China as a core part of the global nuclear order as well. That is, it's armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons. And if, when you had the real Cold War, those two ideological superpowers with all their competitive alliances and militaries and political parties or whatever, uh, they were able to avoid any kind of conflict of that type, although sometimes a bit luckily as well. Um, it just strikes me that, and then you added the economic and financial. So would you, 
are you you basically are you challenging the kind of realist theory which sort of largely dominates within the American discourse at the moment with what you say? You're muted, by the way. Sorry. Um, am I challenging Alison's conclusion that, that they will go to war together? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, I, I, honestly, I think it's really difficult to predict because um, the kind of rivalry that we're seeing, the competition between the US and China at the moment, um, it, it isn't like um, it, we haven't really seen this kind of competition before. I think that that's been characterized by, um, you know, geopolitical and military competition, um, but so much financial and economic interdependence. So I think it's it's really um, it, it's really difficult to point to precedents that can you know help us understand what's going to happen in the future here, um, because I can't I can't think of another example of two great powers that were so closely intertwined financially, um, but but also um, where there was great military competition. Uh, so I suppose that's my way of saying I don't I don't actually know yet. I haven't decided um, whether I think they'll go to war or not. I mean, yeah. I, I certainly think that, um, you know, there's no way that the American public would think that fighting a war um, in, the, in the defense of Taiwan or for the South China Sea would be as important as the Chinese public would think it would be. I think it would be very difficult for U.S. officials to justify a war like that to sure. the U.S. public. Just a few, two or three years ago, I think it was Corey Shaka wrote a book uh, called Safe Passage, which was the transition from British supremacy, if you like, world power, to American world power, and talked about the level of conflict that occurred even in that relatively so-called safe passage. That is to say, no one who is top dog likes to give way to anyone else and they try to hold on to as much of their positions as possible. So that is to say, if between two Anglo-Saxon powers, two culturally, historically, linguistically linked, and even with strategic interests in a global system, which are pretty very similar, that the, you had turbulence, that the US forced itself in various ways of the US, the loan in 1945, uh, then the sort of rejection of imperial preference uh, and those kinds of things and the kind of gradual UK suicide in regard to the colonial possessions as well. I guess what I'm getting to is, is this not expected that you will have turbulence, that if you have turbulence, even between two powers which are so closely historically linked, that two powers which are culturally distinct are likely to have a number of powers. And there's a kind of racial element, I would say, which we haven't talked about, that is a non-Western power able to stand up and challenge the United States positions and offer the world its resources in terms of aid development and so on and so forth. Whatever we may think of them, whether they're imperialistic or not, the fact remains that there is a challenger, there is a, another uh, axis or pole in world politics, and that is likely to cause a great deal of turbulence, even if actually the two powers, you look at the Peterson Institute of International Economics surveys, US Chambers of Commerce, <laughs> American big corporations are not going anywhere. They want to continue to make large amounts of money from China. So, you know, you're right. This is a different kind of thing. And President Xi, circa 2011, 2012, talked about a new type of great power partnership. And, um, and Xu Hong, uh, Hua and I wrote an article in RIPE um, in 2020 or thereabouts, uh, which was about Karl Kautsky and his ideas about so-called ultra-imperialism. And I just wonder whether you might want to sort of uh, look into some of that. But it does suggest that we are living in a, in a different kind of challenge in world politics. It's, it's called the New Cold War, but it ain't quite what it used to be. Uh, and we are still in that kind of middle of it. So that we should expect turbulence, even encased within financial and economic interdependence, because ruling elites, corporate elites are making very large amounts of money, Chinese ones and American ones, from each other, in each other and in the world. So 
So would we not expect some level of turbulence and some level of threat inflation? And the Chinese are threatening, uh, doing threat inflation as well, right? There's a populist right or nationalism, uh, which is increasing in its kind of intensity as a way of unifying two unstable countries. The US is so unstable, it's its second main political party it doesn't even support democracy anymore. You know, and you got China uh, in which their instabilities are very, very great as well. So I just wondered, you know, Oz's point about performativity, that here you have two elites sitting on top of volcanoes in their own countries, each one ramping up the threat to try to maintain their own legitimacy um, and not succeeding particularly well at the moment in the Biden case, his infrastructure programs about competing China are not going very well. Very well. So anyway, that's by virtue of a kind of rambling, I don't know, whatever intervention. But you have the last word, please. Oh, well, well just very briefly then. I mean, you know, I, I think I, I agree that um, we should expect turbulence um, and that is normal. But I guess the important thing is that the two countries find some way of managing their rivalry. And I think, you know, you could argue that the, the US and the Soviet Union um, found a way of managing the existential dimension to their rivalry. And I think at the moment, um, the, it's like the kind of the guardrails have gone um, and, and there's no, there's not enough dialogue and they haven't worked out what the new kind of parameters of the relationship are and how far are they prepared to go. So I think the important thing is that, that they develop some ways to kind of manage this competition um, to make it a bit more stable. Sure. I, I was reading Peril. Uh, I'm still reading Peril, uh, the book uh, by Bob Woodward and somebody else uh, about Trump's presidency. And he talks about uh, General Milley, Mark Milley, phoning up his Chinese counterpart uh, during January 2021, and when people thought that Trump might declare some sort of an attack uh, as a way of diverting attention and so on from the election and then afterwards as well. So I wonder if there are actual sort of back channels which are operating, maybe not very well or systematically yet, but may develop. But anyhow, anyhow, thank you so much, Maria, for your for your talk and the Q&A. Absolutely fantastic. And to, to Bamo and uh, to Sashi as well. As usual, big questions, too many questions and not enough time, but we have actually gone longer than any other previous webinar in our series. It is two minutes past six on a Friday evening. So thank you so much for, for persevering and for your, your uh, papers and uh, your work. I hope you'll be able to present some uh, a, bl a blog post, maybe a couple of thousand words in due course. Javaria will be in touch about that. But I wanna thank our audience as well for sticking with us uh, for this uh, this wonderful uh, webinar and discussions too. So, and Javaria, of course, the usual does all the hard work behind the scenes, as does Tanya uh, as well. So, thank you so much, everyone. And we'll be back next week. I think we're talking about uh, Africa in world politics. So, just another small question to deal with next Friday. But thank you so much, everyone, and um, see you again next week. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye now. Thank you. Bye.